Hey, Vash. Howdy. Howdy. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, yeah, we've we've got you here um, uh, uh, live into an audience. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, would you uh, uh, like to introduce yourself? I imagine you do a better job than I. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm ha really happy to be here with all of you. Uh, my name is Jana Ludwig, and I am here because I'm a candidate for the United States Senate seat that Mike Enzi in Wyoming is retiring from. Um, I've been a community activist around climate and LGBTQ rights and anti-police violence and a whole host of other things for a lot of years and also have some background in the nonprofit world. And I'm a writer and we'll probably get into everything else that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do our best, I think. Um, you are from the great state of Wyoming. How long have you lived there? Um, I've been here for about four years full time, and then I was back and forth for about a year before then. Gotcha. Uh, just uh, do you want to get on cam for this or uh, uh, would you prefer just voice? Oh, no, we can do cam. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah. Let me, go. Gotcha. Let me get this set up proper. Thank you. Um, yeah. The um, so I think I'm, I probably speak um, to some extent uh, for my audience here as well when I say very regrettably, uh, I don't actually know much about Wyoming. Um, I guess uh, uh, to start, like, what is the um, general political disposition there um, in your experiences in the state? Well, it's I mean, it gets rated as being a safe red state on you know, like all of the different metrics that measure that kind of thing. But it's a really interesting state in some ways. Like I, you know, I think that it's, there's different brands of conservative conservatism in the country. And, you know, Wyoming is definitely strongly on the side of the sort of, you know, neighborly, you do your thing, I'll do mine. Um, and isn't necessarily as much of the like, actively mess with your neighbors vibe that I think we see in some places in the country where um, where I think things are a little bit scarier than they are in Wyoming, right? right? Um, and, you know, the, the Democrats tend to get about 30% of the vote, uh, you know, depending on who it is. Sometimes the numbers wobble a little bit from that. Um, and, you know, and I would say generally speaking, you know, you've got a thing where, you know, the Democratic Party, uh, you know, folks who identify as Democrats are oftentimes very much in the like, we've all got to stick together in a way that masks some really big differences, I think, within the party. Oh, and very much agreed. I think yeah. we're feeling that quite a bit right now. Yeah, definitely. And that's true all over. And one of the things that's been really interesting, you know, campaigning as a, you know, very progressive socialist who's being open about that, member of the LGBT community, and somebody who's been involved with intentional communities for a lot of years is that I'm finding myself tapping into this like really intense strand of like, actually, you know, Wyoming Democrats, a lot of them are not very moderate. Like there's some very, very progressive people in this state. And I think what we're seeing is that some of those, some of those differences and some of the ability for the more progressive people to really get their voices heard, you know, if not get people elected, um, I think it's coming to the surface a lot more right now. And so it's a really interesting time to be uh, getting politically active in Wyoming. Um, there's also an interesting thing where the, the Republican Party is kind of eating itself right now in Wyoming, which I think it's doing in a lot of places. But there's, you know, this big move where like the state officials are very much at the far right end of the spectrum and most of the county party officials in the republican party are not and um and there's some pretty active battles going on i think in both parties right now so um you know i'm not really sure what i'm gonna think wyoming politics is in another like eight or nine months i think that that's changing very quickly which is fascinating gotcha interesting um would you say then, so you said that the, you, you have these um, Republican officials who are very far right, and then you have, I guess, more like close to the people, more moderate um, people in, in local positions. When you say mm -hmm. very far right, um, do you mean these high austerity level, like uh, completely defund social program type right? Or are we talking more of an older era? Like, I wouldn't say like not segregationist, obviously, we're a bit mm -hmm. past that, but sort of a, a an echo of that era, people who are deeply uncomfortable with the promotion of human rights and, and egalitarianism. 
Well, when I say far right in that context, I definitely mean the like the Trump clones, you know, the people okay, who yeah, are, yeah. really aren't interested in any kind of social. The people that like my grandparents would probably be appalled to consider themselves to be in the same party with. And they were lifelong Republicans. So, yeah, it's pretty scary. I mean, my the main opponent on the um Republican side for this race right now is Cynthia Lummis, and she is basically running on, I'm going to have Trump's back. Like, that's pretty much her platform. And um, and she is unfortunately typical of a certain strand of the Republicans in the state. And, you know, I'm talking to a lot of Republicans who are, like, really unhappy with what's happening, and they don't really know what to do with that. You know, I think that they're struggling a lot to know, like, where do I place my loyalties right now? Because this is really ugly. But Democrats, ah. <laughs> no, yeah, or, you know, Democrats, Hillary Clinton, Benghazi emails. I, yeah, it's a whole, you know, a lot of, lot of luggage there. Um, that is, God, that's so interesting to me because something that I've been hoping for a while is, see, I'm, you know, I, I'm not constrained, I think, by the limitations of civility as you are. I think these people are lunatics. Anyone who unironically pledges themselves, like, behind Trump is, 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 who. But, um. But what, what I hope for, I think, is is this implosion to take place after whether that happened now or whether that happened in four years, Trump is gone because we have a personality cult in the Republican Party right now. And it feels like the energy of the party can't sustain itself without somebody else that, I don't know, ridiculous, that fiery, that, that, that populist or faux populist, I guess, to run behind. Are you feeling that now, like eventually the Republican Party is going to lean so far into that personality cult, it's going to leave behind a lot of people who might move over to us if for no other reason than because our public officials aren't crazy? You know, I wish that I had... Oh, well, maybe I don't. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I wish that I had a little more of an insider perspective to be able to answer that, but I don't really know. I mean, I know what's been public enough that if you're paying attention, you can sort of see those fissure lines happening in the Republican Party. But I don't really know enough to be able to be like, oh, this is the way I think the wind is blowing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I actually, you know, I wrote a blog post back in December where I was talking about, it was in reaction to like Obama saying, you know, people need to chill out about the primaries. And my basic point of it was like, I think both of these parties are in battles for kind of the soul of the party right now. And I think that the outcome of this next round of elections is going to determine a lot about, you know, A, do we have, is it just neoliberalism all the time? And that's like the only option that we have in voting, um, which is looking like it might be if it ends up being Biden Trump, um, you know, or are we actually going to like have a party, at least on the Democratic side, that actually is finally willing to like take on that sort of core set of beliefs about austerity and about everything should be privatized. And that I think these are really important kind of epic battles. And the difference between a Sanders and Biden Democrat to me is about the same as the difference between a Romney and Trump Democrat. And, yeah. you know, for some reason, like I'm looking at that and I, and, you know, honestly, at this point, I would vote for Romney before I'd vote for Biden. And, you know, that scares the crap out of me that I'm going to say that. But, you know, like I think there's, think there is a thing about like the far right end of both parties is pretty scary right now. Interesting. So you think then that um, that a Biden, I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess here and assume that you're a Bernie Sanders fan. Uh, I am. Know. I am. I have endorsed Bernie officially and have been sort of a burner for a long time. So yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I, I figured that one, you know, always good to check. Um, so you then you're of the opinion then that um, the, the, the Democratic Party is, is responding to this political turmoil in like the worst way by propping up these, these increasingly like conservative, um, like unviable candidates in, a, in an attempt to recapture the, I guess you would call it the civility or the political tone of the, of the Obama era before we really jumped into the, 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 the populism that we're being rocked with right now. Yeah, and I don't know if it's a if it's a longing for civility. I mean, I think that there's a genuine fear about what's happening in the world with Trump and I think there's blinders that come into play when like you see a D next to someone's name and you assume that they're a better person. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I think we saw that we saw a really scary possibility with that with like Mike Bloomberg where it's like like there is no way in hell that Mike Bloomberg should be considered a Democrat. No, and, and no sane world is Mike Bloomberg even tangentially a Democrat. Totally, 
basically, well, but all the vote blue, no matter who people were like, but you'll vote for him. If you, and I'm like, no, <laughs> like, so, I mean, I think that there's that, that the vote blue, no matter who thing to me feels like that is the most dangerous thing going on right now in the democratic party, because what it's basically saying is you should check your discernment at the door. Like if there's a D next to the name, that is all we need to know. We don't need to know anything about policies. We don't need to know anything about ethics. You know, we don't need to know anything about whether the person is like mentally fit to be in the office. You just, you see the D, you check the box. And that is about the most undemocratic thing that I can possibly imagine us putting out there. And the fact that, you know, the Democratic Party, you know, and it's, Look, I don't know that the, I guess the DNC, that's sort of their whole thing, but like there's a hell of a lot of just average regular Democrats who are scared shitless right now and they're reaching for vote blue no matter who. And it's like, I have empathy for the fear, but like, Jesus, people, like, really? <laughs> like, you want me to not think about this? That's how we've been getting, you know, disaster after disaster for working people. For I'm going to take a wild guess and say that the DNC probably hasn't put through any super PAC money to you um, uh, uh, oh. in, in the recent <laughs> past. Uh, pro probably not on the short donors list, you know, not on the speed dial. Um, we need more people criticizing the DNC in that respect because I agree the 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 um, the 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 intricacies of so does that mean will you be staying home or will you be voting Biden or or Trump or do you not want to say? I you know I don't know I mean I think that part of it depends on you know is my assessment at the end well first of all I mean I don't think Bernie's out of this yet I mean I think that Obama was actually behind by more. Uh, delegates at this stage um, when he won the nomination. So I'm not convinced that um, that Bernie is out of this. And I do think that coronavirus might be waking some folks up to the idea that, you know, whether you think Medicare for all is pie in the sky, maybe we need it. And so I'm not sure, like, I'm not going to 100% predict that's what the outcome is going to be. If it is, I mean, I think it'll depend a lot on do I feel like even if I don't like the outcome, like Biden won this fair. And if there's any way that I can get to that point, I might vote for Biden. But at this point, like if it was today, um, I would probably write Bernie in, you know, or I'd vote, you know, for some third party person. Um, yeah. No, so, I know. I, I, cause, because right now, and, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to um, uh, uh, characterize your perspective in a way that alienates you from the average Democratic voter. But um, at the moment, I mean, Biden has, is a non-candidate. I mean, he hasn't campaigned. Um, they, mm -hmm. they prop him up. They stiffen him with like a plastic sealant so we can stand up straight before the yeah. debates, you know, so he doesn't topple yeah. over. And I think that's right. the extent to which he has participated in this process um, thus right. far. It's yeah. pretty. It's pretty wild. I um uh, um one of the things I'm really concerned about, though, and I think this is something that would affect you especially, um, because I imagine you're going more for sort of like the local advocacy vote, um, uh, uh mm -hmm. than giant corporate donors. Just a wild yeah. guess there. Yeah. You will still, and I imagine encourage others as well to vote down ballot. Um, when the mm -hmm. time comes, right? Even if we don't like who's ever whoever is up there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and at this point, the other Democrat who's in my primary, I mean, she and I are not identical by any stretch of the imagination, but it's kind of like we both think that, like, I'm the Sanders and she's the Warren. And I, you know, if she ends up being the nominee in my race, I will throw my support behind her because I think, you know, her number one issue is climate. And I think that has to be the, like, top two issues has got to include climate change We're right now. We're all going to die. Well, you, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, coronavirus is scary and climate change is a lot scarier. And um, and so I will throw my support behind her. Um, you know, I also have like the person who's running in my local district for um, the state Senate is somebody who I really like. And so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to encourage people to sit it out. And, you know, if what we're trying to do is to get the DNC to like wake up and realize what they've been doing, leaving the president blank while you vote for everything else actually can be a pretty strong message. Um yeah, but again, I don't know, you know, ask me on November 2nd what I want people to do. <laughs> it's a long road. It's a long it's road a long until road. then. Sorry. It is going, every okay. week feels like a year in this oh fucking cycle. It is exhausting. Um, the yeah. That's one of the things that I think bothers me the most about socialists. 
um, at least in this country, because there is a horrible, horrible habit of um, of of getting sort of upset and feeling disenfranchised in the presidential mm-hmm. election, and then they don't mm-hmm. participate at all in the myriad local or the midterms. They don't vote for Congress people or senators. They don't vote for mayors or city council people. They don't vote for measures or ballots. And that's really frustrating to me because the mechanisms that oppose socialist, um, you know, political interference are at their most powerful on a national level, but at a local level. Here in Seattle, we just recently had a socialist uh, city councilwoman uh, instrumental in preventing Amazon from, uh, you know, right, right reaping right. a tremendous amount of profit from this place. And it frustrates me. So many people are like, ah, oh, oh, whatever, Biden, Trump. And then there's like 80 more provisions they could have gotten their, their ink right. on that they completely ignore. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I also think it's important because, I mean, if you believe in electoral politics, and I think that there are reasons why people disengage from the whole thing completely, and I'm not going to like judge those reasons, but if you believe in electoral politics, I mean, one of the things that I bump into right now running is that people are like, well, but you've never even run for office before. And um, and I think it's important that we have opportunities for people who you know, are socialists to like get in there and actually build a little bit of a resume because for some voters that does matter a lot. I mean, some people don't care if they, you know, if they like your policies, if they like how you're articulating things, they're going to vote for you and they don't care if you have any kind of political resume. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that like, you know, having been on city council or, you know, being a county commissioner or whatever, I think before, you know, I do think that that builds legitimacy in some people's eyes. And so I, you know, I really support people who are socialist running for those local offices and, you can often find more connection and ability to cooperate, you know, and sometimes particularly with Republicans, actually, because they are more locally oriented in how they do things and they care about how local stuff is playing out. You know, they're often more focused on local stuff. Um, And so I think there's the opportunity to have a lot of cooperation between locally elected socialists and Greens and independents and Republicans. And then, you know, it's, it's a weird coalition, but sometimes you actually end up you know, in tension with your local Democrats more than your local Republicans. And I think learning how to, you know, talk about things in ways that are relevant to different groups of people, you know, a lot of that happens in local politics for folks. That has been the spirit of the past few months, more tension with your local Democrats than with than with the Republicans. Yeah. I swear to God, I, at this point, I mean, I feel like the Republicans are almost a force of nature. At least the Trump bloc is. There are undecideds in the middle that I think are very alienated and disaffected right now. And they're, yep. uh, you know, on one hand, you've got Trump and they don't like Trump. But on the other hand, Democrats want to steal all their guns or what? I don't know. Um, but I feel like these people could be reasoned. The Trump block, not so much. So it feels like most of my antagonism is being directed at, 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 at fucking Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, Warren and Biden supporters um, who have just uh, uh, merged together into some sort of homunculus of centrist you right. know, might that that it seems to be opposing any real systemic change in our party. Right, right. And that's the simultaneously vote blue no matter who and you're asking for too much. And I'm like, you know what we need to fucking be doing? We need to be asking for too much. Like, I'm not even sure what too much means at the moment, but like people are dying. People can't go to the doctor. Um, you know, trans women of color are being killed at like horrific rates like our military personnel aren't even being treated very like the people that like the like centrists are supposed to be like caring about like we have coal miners who are in this climate transition right now who are incredibly struggling and it's like we need to care about those people and like if the democratic party if centrists in the democratic party aren't going to do that then they have zero right to be pushing people to like vote for just any old person who has a D next to their name. I mean, I'm very frustrated with that whole dynamic right now. Yeah, the, the thing I'm most interested in, my concern with the vote blue no matter who versus um, versus uh, 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 Bernie or Bust, which I guess that's the most of the sentiment, my main concern is I worry that the DNC doesn't care 
about winning a presidential election because the corporate sponsors that they have are preserved in either case, that the DNC is just this massive front that is meant to uh, pacify the progressive wing of this country without actually affecting real economic change. So it's, there's this, it's this horrifying feeling that it's not only that electoralism doesn't work within the DNC, it's that it just is mathematically impossible to overcome the corporate interests that determine who become the president. And that's why I'm so invested in local campaigns. And I guess also in your campaign, which I've done a good bit of reading on since we last spoke, um, because the process of circumventing that weight with real responsive local politics is I think mm-hmm. the only hope we have before we, we start getting placed on, you know, like a, uh, before before the the government treats us with some degree of suspicion, I think for our for our enthusiasm, and I want to know, in your experience, like I guess for the benefit of the audience, tell me, how did it get started? What got you interested? How did you start? How do you even run for local office? Did you did you file like a, like a, in a letter? Or I want to know about yeah. all of it. Well, and so so I'm so because I'm running for a U.S. Senate seat, I'm uh you know, my actual filing date isn't until like May 29th or something. We have um, very late politics in Wyoming because the weather here is so horrible for so much of the year that like you can't actually canvas until kind of late. So, which all makes a lot of sense, but it does mean that our election cycle is, our election season is even longer than in a lot of places. And so, um, so I will have to file on, um, you know, in this window is about a month long window for filing. And then I pay 200 bucks and I'm on the, you know, ballot. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, so So that's the sort of technical part of it. I mean, I was definitely in the category of like, never thought I would run for office and certainly never thought I would run for federal office. And yeah, that's like, uh, that's a big step too. It's a big step. And it's a smaller step in Wyoming. I mean, it's a bigger step in terms of like what you'd actually be doing if you won, you know, but we only have like 580,000 people in the state. Um, Like it's not, it's like more equivalent to like a house race in a lot of other states. So there's that part to it. Um, So it did feel more accessible to me. Um, But I, you know, and so I, I had mentioned that I've like been a climate activist for a really long time. And I started waking up um, in the middle of the night, I think it was about February of last year with this like, you should run for public office thing going through my head. And my immediate response to that voice in my head was no fucking way. <laughs> like, are you crazy? Why? Why would I do that Why to myself? Why would I do this to myself? Right, exactly. And, but then when I really started thinking about it, I mean, the voice persisted. And when I really started thinking about it, um, you know, I realized that I have a fairly unique background um, where I've lived in eco villages, among other kinds of communities, where I've been part of answering the question of what does a post carbon life look like that is, you know, accessible and inclusive and, you know, economically just and like a whole bunch of other interrelated questions. Like, I've, I've actually gotten to live that reality of sort of what the my life in the eco village would be sort of what the green new deal would be writ large, you know, if we had a vibrant democracy and, you know, not like a a top down thing, but really a kind of like local initiative, um, you know, people led version of the green new deal. Like I've actually experienced that. And so the number one thing that that gives me is that I know you can do it. And I don't think it's pie in the sky and I don't think it has to be incredibly expensive And I do think that we can combine it with like a racial and economic justice platform. And when I look around Wyoming, I was like, there isn't anybody else who has that kind of experience that I know of in the state with the possible exception of folks on the Indian reservation. And, and so I was pretty diligent about like reaching out and asking questions about like, is there anybody from the res who's going to like run for this office? And when, you know, all of the connections that I had said it, that it didn't look like anybody was going to, I was like, well, then I, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm the best person, but I'm definitely a good person um, to be doing this. And, you know, and so it was like, well, it was kind of that thing that I hear women say a lot, which is, okay, well, why not me? And that was kind of the thing that tripped me over into like, okay, I think I'm going to do this. And it feels like 
a Hail Mary pass, you know, at the end of the football game where it's like you you throw the ball 70 yards and try to make that final score because we are out of fucking time. And yeah, sports is, ball. You know, yeah. I mean, this is this is my attempt to like do something beyond the kind of educational stuff and community building stuff that I've been doing, but on a larger scale. Um, because I just don't think I just don't think we have any time left. And so whether I'm imperfect or not isn't the point, you know. The point is am I gonna go and am I gonna fight for it? And the answer is yes. I feel like we're so close to this conversation not even being about how to prevent catastrophe, but who's going to rule over the sort of ramshackle Mad Max esque post climate uh, America that we are yeah. hurtling towards at an incredible speed. Yeah, Mad Marx. Um, I think when <laughs> we, because we, we are going to have to make substantive changes. A lot of people are really. Um, pessimistic about this they they say or they think like oh green new deal uh if we actually start doing all this wacky stuff um it's going to um it, no one will be able to fly we'll all have to crawl on our hands and knees from the restaurant to the house no one can drive you know we'll all have to use recycled cardboard for our toothbrushes just but <laughs> i genuinely believe and maybe this is naive of me that almost every comfort of modern life can be, even for us privileged Americans, could be preserved if only we were more responsible with using what we had. And I think a lot of eco-villages adhere almost to that, mm -hmm. to that philosophy because from what I've heard of them, having never been myself, it seems like a more eco-friendly and ergonomic design to the mm -hmm. community takes away almost nothing but adds a lot. Can you share your experiences in that uh, space? Yeah. yeah, for sure. And so I, so one of the frameworks that's been really helpful for me to put my experience in community and particularly in the eco villages that I've been a part of uh, into context, and then I think is also scalable up, you know, to very large scales, including like a whole country the size of the United States, is this framework that looks at sustainability as having four different parts to it, and which is worldview, social, economic, and ecological. And we get really obsessed with the ecological, you know, looking at like, so we need to put solar panels everywhere and that will like fix everything. And the problem with approaching it that directly is that there are a lot of barriers to doing that right now. And so there's, um, you know, sort of worldview values, barriers to it that I think like, people who are in leadership roles could be using that platform to actually get people to be asking themselves better questions about, you know, about like, do we need as much? And is this like super fast pace work 80 hours a week lifestyle actually what we really want to be doing? You know, I think that there's ways that, that we could be um, asking different questions and encouraging a deeper level of thoughtfulness. And it is also about what you were saying about the like using what we have well. And so those are all worldview things. And then there's social things. And the key that makes um, places like Dancing Rabbit Eco Village, which is where I was before I moved here, the key that makes that actually work is cooperation and figuring out how we can, you know, collectivize things and do things with each other instead of against each other, basically. Uh, and so, you know, at Dancing Rabbit, that means things like, you know, there's four cars for 60 people and you figure out how to share them. And so it's like car share programs in cities are basically doing things that were pioneered in intentional communities. And now we have these like big systems in like major urban areas that are basically using the same principles that Dancing Rabbit uses. Um, it also means things like public transit. I mean, if we had high speed rail all over this country, people wouldn't want to fly as much. You know, they wouldn't oh, need to. They God, to, no. In a know, post 9 I mean, 11, why would anyone want to bother with an airport when you can just buy totally. a ticket and go on a light rail? I've been to Japan. I, I went back when I was a, a tiny baby boy of 20, yeah, 20. And, um, the the I was only in Tokyo, of course, so I was at the heart of it all. But the public transit there, I mean, the, the investment has paid off dozens yeah. of times over. It, it, it makes the inner city 
so much more accessible and it, it less space needed for parking, which means you can put businesses together more densely, which means that there's less exhaust and output. It means it takes less energy to move people around. It means it also builds a collective sense of community. Um, mm -hmm. Though there are many problems with social atomization in Japan, um, the, 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 the uh, public transit element is like a, a communal facet of their life. It's, it's inherent to how their country works. Um, and meanwhile, in America, the archetypical American experience is a 48 hour, sorry, 48 minute commute, both to and from work and, and yeah. sitting on the 405 with your face pressed against the wheel, um, cursing the designers of Los Angeles for prioritizing <laughs> cars over, over public transport. That's, that's how we do things over here. Totally. Yeah. And it's also, um, yeah. And so all of that and, you know, and there's like many different ways that we could be sharing more. I mean, and, and this is where it starts bridging from social into the economic is that, you know, things like public libraries, public parks. I mean, this is like public infrastructure that we all really like and is basically like manifest versions of cooperation. And then we get all like up in arms about socialism. And it's like, you know, we're actually doing a fair bit of sharing stuff already. And what we haven't taken this step to, though, is to then pressing on. So does profit driven economics make sense at all? Like we've been living with this sort of like garish hybrid of the two things for a long time. And the stuff that when people actually look at it is actually really popular and that they love is the stuff that leans towards socialized systems. And the stuff that all of us hate, which is like, you know, Walmart and like having to like, have companies gatekeep our access to healthcare, which is basically all the insurance industry is, you know, like people hate that shit. And, you know, but we're not uh, willing to like- uh, Oh, you don't understand 100% of Americans are actually satisfied with their healthcare system if the alternative is dying. <laughs> don't you Don't you see? I've this this system is fine uh, as it is. Oh my God, I've heard that, but I haven't actually experienced it. I have never met a single all. human being in my life who wasn't above <laughs> right. like a $500,000 a year income bracket who liked their health insurance. I have not met one, not a single one. And even the people with good insurance, I mean, if you get fired around the time you uh, need some it's a surgery or you have an accident, like, oops. Right, right. Well, and the fact that they can just arbitrarily declare things to be not covered. Like there's this horrifying story running around the internet right now about a woman who, um, you know, her husband was in a job specifically because they had good health coverage, had stayed in that job, even though he didn't like it because his wife was pregnant. She goes into labor early. You know, the baby ends up having to have like intense ICU care and the insurance company denied anything related to the child because that child was not covered. And it's like, what the actual fuck are we doing with our healthcare system? It's like this, this horrifying mix of like gatekeeping and gaslighting and, and, but it's just normal. And, and it's because we're used to like, this is what capitalism is allowed to do. And so, you know, we've got to, I think if we really want to be applying what we're learning in eco villages to a broader society, one of those pieces is absolutely going to be questioning how our economic system is structured and the fact that you know ceos make 361 times what the average worker makes is like like horrifying and appalling and about the most fucked up thing i have ever heard the, the like, worst thing is that we we gatekeep progress behind these people's livelihoods you know they'll say know. oh yeah well we can't get rid of private insurance think of all the insurance agents we put who'd be put out you know without a job which to me is like oh you, you want to get rid of the axe bros the people who run around hitting people with axes, but but that's their job. What about their kids? Like, right, right. Well, it's and it's like, and the funny thing about that is, for misery. Like, really, really, all that we're protecting is the CEOs because there would still be work in like processing like financial claims and stuff. It's like it's not like that work would go away. Yeah, Medicare just, for all would take a huge amount of bureaucratic work. Right, they're, exactly. They're needed. Their work is needed. Absolutely. And they're the ones who already know what they're doing in terms of this. But like, wouldn't it be nice for those folks to not have to be in a position of like denying people's claims? Because that must feel like shit. Like, I can't quite imagine being the person working for an insurance company whose job is to tell people that their five year old gets to die now. Like, like, that's just like horrifying to me. And I know they are in that job voluntarily. But what does voluntarily even mean? 
in the current economic system. The implicit system. coercion. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. And, and someone else would just be doing that job, you know, and they have a family to feed. It's like, it's the beginning of The Incredibles, right? The, the Bob Parr, you know, he's the, the, the insurance claims that he was filing with that lady and he was like, hey, if you go here and here, because he feel, clearly feels guilty about the work that he does. Um, right. Everyone knows the insurance industry is terrible. This is like, this, this is like, it's American as apple pie. Everyone knows that these systems are broken. We just don't, we, we just get real quiet about it once somebody talks about a solution. It's okay to complain about your boss or about uh, commutes or about the highways, everything. Um, but mm -hmm. the moment any, anyone's like, wait, hey, you know, we don't have to complain. We can fix it. All Everyone gets real quiet, real right. quiet, real quick. Right. And what would happen in this country if we pulled that pin out? If like we were no longer capitalist apologists as like a, like one of our big pastimes, like what could actually happen? You know, like we could have Medicare for all and, you know, we could actually do the whole Green New Deal, which, you know, I mean, Bernie's version of it creates something like 20 million jobs. I mean, it's it's as much about job creation as it is about um, you know, some sort of like ecological program. And, and I think that people forget that. And, you know, and I think that what our economic practices are more than anything else determines what our ecological practices are. You know, the fact that like these companies need to be generating huge profits for not just CEOs who are making ridiculous amounts of money compared to the rest of us, um, but also shareholders means that they're pushing and pushing and pushing consumerism like in a thousand different ways. And then we have this whole advertising sector that's like basically about pushing consumerism when it comes down to it. And, you know, and imagine where all of that money and productivity could be going toward good things that are actually going to like get us back to a point where we have a stable climate. And like, that's all possible if you unpin capitalism. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. It's, it's you know, the, the, the trash can of ideology. It's the reification of existing power structures through the common acceptance of uh, basic injustices, you know, no reasonable society, whatever, like, no, if, if someone were designing a society, if we could just build this from the top up, like uh, SimCity or something, you know, no one would think, oh, yeah, what if we gatekept everyone's health? behind business provided plans that are orchestrated by bureaucrats who are financially incentivized to not provide healthcare. Nobody yeah. would, that would be insane. But no, we, no. but we are, here, here we are. By the way, incredibly rude of me to not ask immediately. My chat uh, is, is, is riling up right now. Do you have a link that you can provide me um, for some of the rowdy folks who are watching who would like to donate? Um, yeah, and that's actually, um, it's just on Act Blue. And I think yeah, they have the correct link right now. I just want to make sure they're not donating to some, uh, uh, you know, the, the sneaky Republicans who have set up one, yeah, uh, yeah. donate yeah. with one letter different, you know? <laughs> well, I think um, as far as I know, I'm not on anyone's radar enough to have impersonators, but let me pop you the actual real link to it. And the other thing that I want to um, push here in terms of donations, so yes, please donate directly to my campaign, but also donate to the Rose Caucus, which is a um, group of candidates that are all pretty much like me in terms of our politics who are running in uh, mostly national and um, state races all around the country. And also check out the Rose Caucus uh, website. And so I'm just gonna, we're, we are at Rose Caucus on Twitter, and that's one way to find us. Um, but I'd encourage folks, if you want to make a donation to me, that's great. But if you split it between me and the Rose Caucus, that's even better for the world. Um, are you um, with with the DSA uh, as well? Or um, is the Rose Caucus sort of like an affiliate or, or similar organization? Well, the, um, so, so DSA is explicitly non-electoral. It's not an, uh, it's not a political party. Um, the Rose Caucus is situating ourselves, you know, most of us currently situate ourselves at the like far left end of the Democratic Party, and we are explicitly electoral. I mean, that's the whole point. So they're functioning in different domains. And I think running a lot of parallels to each other in terms of, you know, most of us are DSA members in addition to being part of the Rose Caucus. Um, so they're just kind of different. They're like apples and oranges, but they're both socialists. Right, right. Same apples. same general direction forward, one electoral. It's good to know there's an electoral um, uh, uh, sort of leaning 
a socialist group because yeah. there there are a lot of people I know I guess um uh, uh you know very edgy fans of mine mm -hmm. who who believe like the time has come to abandon electoralism you know the proletariat the time is now rise up with nine muskets and yeah. I think yeah. there was so much good work I feel like we've barely been trying the left was asleep um, up until like five years ago, there was no American left movement until Bernie Sanders. No, no I'm sorry. No active, uh, uh, broadly known left movement in this yeah. country up until Bernie Sanders kind of reminded everyone that there was an alternative to Obama era fake progressivism. And right. I think we've got a lot more, you know, progress to be made, though. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, I don't think that progress can take place within a... Um, vote just just no complaints just vote for anyone with a d next to their name just be right. quiet shut up we'll, we'll give you who you vote for you know right i mean i think that really responsible you know you're using your discernment and you're using your compassion to figure out how to vote um electoral politics is one chunk of a whole bunch of things that need to be happening. I mean, there's a ton of like local direct organizing that needs to happen. You know, there's a lot of like, I one of my work hats is that I do um, still a lot of education and training work around like, you know, things like consensus, things like how do you like live together or work closely together and not end up hating each other after three months? Um, you know, like that kind of basic social dynamic stuff. I mean, there's a lot of really good educational stuff you know, there is transformation that needs to happen within, you know, I would say every occupation in the country has work to do around sustainability and around economic and racial justice stuff. And, you know, so I don't think that electoral politics is the whole thing. And, you know, like I said before, like I'm getting into this late for me, like I'm, I just turned 50 and I've been an activist on the ground for many, many years without ever wading into the electoral zone. This is not the only thing I value or the only thing that I think needs to be happening. And I do think it needs to be happening and I do value it. You know, I mean, I do think that, you know, if we are not showing up in politics, we are basically ceding a tremendous amount of power to ever oh, yeah. more white spaces and it's like we gotta pull that one back because the right does this game there are literal neo-nazis who, who want a white ethno state who will nonetheless go out there and form orgs form super PACs uh build party structures and work alongside electoral republicans because they know you know the closer they get yeah, it's, it's a step forward. And they've gotten a lot bolder over the past four years. But that's something they do a lot better. I feel like with a lot of lefties, you know, they won electoral defeat and they throw all their, their picket, you know, signs to the ground and go right. off to, to sulk. And I understand a lot of that comes from the relative level of marginalization that left-leaning groups tend to have where they don't have as much time or energy or effort, you know, because every, you know, because all the, all the uh, right-leaning demagogues in this country are like multi-millionaires who got a float on daddy money after failing in their respective profession but <laughs> that that energy is is really really necessary and as important as it is to remember that um you know the civil rights movement was non-electoral broadly it was protest based mm -hmm. and same with mm -hmm. you know the suffrage movement and same with a lot of other stuff none of those would have borne any fruit if there weren't at least sympathetic people in the you know, electoral power structures we have. Not to give the right. credit to them, but it's it's it helps a little bit. Right, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I you know, I think about one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of Bernie Sanders is that I think about he has spent a lot of lonely years, <laughs> you know, in DC. And apparently it has not eroded his basic sense of decency and you know, and so I just have a ton of respect for somebody who's been there for that long and has been, you know, beating these drums. And slowly we are getting more people in D.C. who actually have his back and are even ahead of him on some of these issues, you know, and are, are further along on some of it. And, um, you know, and I feel really grateful to him for having, you know, carved this space out over many, many, many years that there's now space to get in there because we absolutely have got to elect more folks like us like in this next cycle or yeah yeah and yeah. well the work you do is you know yeah incredibly inspiring i think because a lot of people think that running for office is this um this completely inaccessible like like it's it's like, like an average citizen can't do it you have to be like a, a billionaire or something but i mean i think bernie sanders success shows that 
even as an independent, God, um, he was able to affect real change to the extent now that he's probably going to be remembered as one of the great, you know, uh, sort of heroes of American socialism for yeah. centuries now for all the people that he's inspired. He did it entirely um, without rejecting the, the the basic social principles that he that he started on. Um, right. And if you can do, I mean, if he can do that, maybe not anyone can. I imagine it was pretty difficult, but more people can, you know, you can. For sure. Well, and I think, you know, I, I've been saying that, like, for me, it was the combination of Sanders, AOC, Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib that, like, that was, like, enough different people from different backgrounds that I went, oh, so maybe there's not, like, this one type of person that can manage to navigate this stuff, but actually like a lot of different types of people can manage to navigate this and end up there. And it's been great watching those women be like such fierce, such like sort of plain speaking, um, brilliance, you know, advocates for this stuff. And it, you know, it's not that any one of these people is perfect, but I think we need to drop that standard. Like, I don't think it's about being perfect. I think it's about being, um, responsive to the right populations. And I think it's about asking the right questions to some extent. You know, I'm, I feel like politicians ask the question, how is this going to affect my donors? And that's a really boring question, frankly. Like there's nothing interesting that comes out of that question. But I think if we're asking questions like, how is this going to affect working class and poor people? How is it going to affect human rights and civil rights? How is it going to affect the climate? Like that starts generating some pretty interesting answers then about what to do. And so I'm, I'm really, and I don't know if you've seen that on my website, but I have those questions up at the top of my platform page. Yeah, because Your, it's your like, website okay. is actually great, by the way. Um, okay, it's, it's, it. it's, I've, I've, I've looked through, uh, okay, I despise electoral politics on principle, you know, normally what I do oh. Normally, what I do is very non-electoral. I like talking about ideas, um, yeah. and I just get depressed when I engage with electoral politics because, my God, you know. Um, yeah. But recently, I've been looking at a lot of local campaigns. You consider yourself like aligned with the Justice Democrats, if not um, immediately like I, a member? Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah, I'm not a member. They've they've gotten to only I think they're only endorsing like twenty people this cycle. So you know, it was a very high bar and a, you know, a long shot in Wyoming was not going to like make their bar, you know, for, for the most part. Yes. I would say that. I mean, I am further left than most of the justice Democrat folks, but, um, but of all the sort of mainstream well-known organizations, they're probably about the closest to where I'm at. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I fair. By the way, huge source of inspiration for me because the justice Democrats was, I mean, you know, uh, speaking plainly, started basically by a bunch of internet nerds, and now one of the most popular politicians in the country, AOC, is mm -hmm. um, is you know sort of the front line in the progressive war against you know Pelosi esque centrism, um, yes. which is great. You know, maybe one day I too can shit post my way into changing <laughs> the, the the you know the political space. Um, right. But uh, yeah, your 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 website is much put together than like much better put together than any like a. a local sort of grassroots campaigner I've seen in a while. I don't know if you did the website design yourself or if you've got a very talented friend, but it, it, you know, it's quite informative and you, your, yeah. your positions stand out. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, the content was, was all me and the design, like I suck at all the design stuff. So I have other folks who have done the design. Oh, who work. knows how to code, honestly, you know, leave some. <laughs> well, the, the content though, I, I've been very, um, fierce about I'm not going to run unless I can run honest. And that's actually made so many things really easy because I don't have these tortured like, oh, but can I say the thing? And I'm like, well, I'm going to say it and then we can talk about it, <laughs> you know, has been like way more of my orientation rather than sort of trying to like game things. It's like, I, you know, I, I, well, I mean, I suck at lying. I mean, that's part of the bottom line with all of that is that I'm not very good at it. Um, but it's also like, I think we need people who like, you know, their orientation is um, to be as honest as we can be in the process. Yeah, nothing can replace that too, because like, Imagine Hillary Clinton, right? You know, uh, not to not to sp speak. I'm not, you know, these views are mine, not yours. I don't know what, what you're going exactly. But Hillary Clinton, I mean, Hillary, this is this is a person who has sold every square inch of space 
um, in her brain to special interest groups. Uh, everything that she runs by is completely committee run. Every opinion she has is, is focus group tested before she lets it out. And then here comes Bernie Sanders, who didn't have to do any of that. And he still reached those heights. I mean, um, he got a, I, I, is I uh, currently, you know, as close to being the president as she ever was. And he didn't have to sell out to anything. Um, right. And I think it infuriates them because I, I imagine somewhere underneath all that Washington gunk, there's a soul of an activist or a community organizer in a lot of these DNC centrists. And they just were broken and bent and were told how to play the game. And now I think they're going to learn that was never necessary. That was a, that was a concession they made because they were weak, not right. because it was necessary to do so. Right. Well, and, you know, and the question to me is always like, so who are you willing to sell out in order to have a soundbite? And, you know, I feel like I feel like those people who have been on the we're getting sold out list um, are now stepping up a lot more. And like we're demanding space in a way that I don't think we've felt, you know, and I don't know if it's been felt safe or we haven't felt desperate enough or what exactly the formula is for all these different people. But, you know, I'm. I'm basically running because I am scared shitless about where the world is headed right now. And I'm going to let that fear fuel me showing up in like, you know, a pretty strong way and like demanding that, you know, no, these, all of these populations, like we don't get to be sold out anymore in this process. And, you know, and I don't really know any other way to do it. So, so there it is. <laughs> well, I want it known that if I ever run unlikely, given the many things that I've said and done, uh, publicly, but if I ever do, I am willing to sell out to certain um, gamer accessory companies. If Blue or uh, or or Turtle Beach wants uh, wants me to promote them on a national stage, I'll I'll, I'll exceed that, but not much else. Uh, C Cinnabon, um, I've you know a, a great product. I'm willing. Apart from that, I think I think I'm, uh, I'm I'll keep to my you know I'll keep to my principles. They'll get tax breaks. Um, I might to the what is that German the German board game company that created uh you know uh Cities and Knights of Catan you know which is oh. my favorite board game you know wait, like, wait, wait, wait. Knights of Catan I, is your favorite board game oh yeah totally okay totally. all right okay all right that's that's fucking great that's fantastic <laughs> I'm like, either I just said the right thing or I just said the wrong no, thing. No, 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 no. No, it's all good. That's all good. Yeah. No. Chat, chat, fact, chat loves it. She's, they, people, you've got their vote. Oh, chat loves it. Great. If there's people from Wyoming out there, like once we're, uh, once we get through this rush of Corona where I'm not actually doing any public events right now, if you want to set up me getting to play Cities and Nights with you anywhere in the state, I am totally fucking down for that. That would be awesome. <laughs> That would, oh man, I'd have to refer. Listen, it's been a little while, but hey, that's uh, uh, that that gets higher priority than anything else I pencil in. Okay, <laughs> let's see if we all die um, before then to to right, the, exactly. the black death. If I'm not dead, I'm taking you on at the board game. <laughs> This, that's my excuse, you know, because you're probably better than me. If I die to Corona, I could spare the um, the embarrassment of losing, uh, uh, the sh the shame of defeat. So really, I win either way. Um, but. Oh okay. God, that no, that's fantastic. Um, it's it's completely tangential. I've been trying to get back into tabletop gaming for a little bit. I wanted to play like Warhammer 40k with the miniatures, so I'm, I've got to get back into little, little mini paintings. You know. Cool. Is Very this cool. Uh, this is? I assume this is. Would you con Would you consider Knights of Catan a queer culture? Oh, that's an interesting question. I you know, I don't. I don't know because I got introduced to it in the like commune world. And so I think queer. if it is, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's definitely a really strong thread of like queer culture in the commune culture, but yeah, I don't know. What is, what does your chat say? Um, chat, so chat is saying yes, but my chat I think is pretty much entirely gay. So I, there, awesome. awesome. I've, I've noticed though, because I play, I play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I've played it mm -hmm. publicly and not publicly. And from mm -hmm. my experience, this, these, this and other tabletop games are for, I think for their social elements, for their immersion, for their role playing are getting this huge traction in queer communities. And I don't know if I've seen like the queer, like Knights of Catan group or anything, but I've noticed tabletop gaming is seeing a resurgence in these very progressive spaces. And I think it's really interesting. I was just wondering like um, if that yeah. was the way in which you had gotten into it. 
No, no, not through there. But it is funny. I was that girl 40 years ago or yeah, probably 40 years ago, who was the only girl playing D and D. So I was that girl growing up. So, and you know, I probably had some inkling by then that I was bisexual. So I don't know. You're going to make me think about this now. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just, I was just curious. You know, I just, the, um, it's, I, I it's, it's just a, a pattern or a relationship that I've seen. And, uh, cool. and I, I think it's great too, because, because let's, I mean, pretty soon everything is going to be gamified. Video games are a huge market. I love them. I play them all the time. I play them for money. I play them not for money. I love it. And, um, but I think one thing that people don't like very much is that gaming culture is this very um, sort of regressive, atomized space where you just mm-hmm. kind of normalize. You just like sit alone and just you know, it's not yeah, really it's- like a social thing because because split screen gaming has been out of, you know, out of vogue for God decades now. So this tabletop mm-hmm. stuff is a great way for to get people mm-hmm. together again in a way that reminds me of the broader communal elements of, of sort of, you mm-hmm. know, a post-capitalist living or what people imagine post-capitalist living would be like. Right. Ma- maybe right. a right. tangential, but. Mm-hmm. Well, and it gives me hope. I mean, and so, so the slightly not quite so trans- tangential piece. So one of the things that I teach is cooperative culture development. And I talk a lot about the, the fact that like humans have these two parts of our brains that developed evolutionarily. And one of them is very independent and individualistic. And the other one is very communal. And I think we have these struggles. Like, I think the struggle to be a good human at this point is basically about how do you blend those or balance those two sides of our human nature. And so for me, like playing board games and being like super fucking competitive about it within a communal context hits the sweet spot for me (laughs) where I'm like, I'm with my, my comrades and like in real life, we're like totally down for having each other's backs and always, and we're doing all this sharing culture stuff and I'm going to kick your ass. And it's like, it's perfect, you know? Yeah, I think oh. healthy. It's it's a healthy way of uh, uh, processing aggression. I think deep yeah. down, everyone does want to murder their entire friend circle in a deeply <laughs> visceral way. Uh, it's just about finding the right space to to uh, you know evoke those feelings uh, as as legally and healthily as possible. Board games, totally. That's it. That's my answer to that. Like, how do we get that need met? Is board games. <laughs> um, speaking speaking of community. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping to dredge up some inspiration from the, from the people who are watching. What has been the community response to your decision to run? You said you've put public appearances on hold. I think that's a great idea right now. Um, but maybe before that, or generally speaking, um, what has it been like? Well, it's, it's actually been great. I mean, with the, with the exception of this one moment when I was on a, um, conservative talk radio show and some dude called up basically to just scream into the phone why do you hate america and hang up um it's, it's, been, it's pretty effective tactic yeah i know right it's like are we gonna talk about that or you're just gonna hang up um so other than that one moment i feel like folks have been like remarkably receptive and and some of that i think there was a little bit of a false front to that for a while because I was the only Democrat in the race. And, um, and now that there's other Democrats coming in, there's people are starting to ask, you know, a little bit stronger questions about like who exactly I am, which I think is probably healthy. Um, but it's been fun. I've been doing this thing where I, um, get groups to sort of map the economy with me where I, um, and I'm going to talk with my hands now. You've got me on the the thing, right? So like, you know, do like an axis down the middle of a big piece of paper and an axis across. And I put capitalism at the top and socialism and socialized systems at the bottom. And then like um, multinational at one end and local at the other end. And I'm like, let's figure out what the economy actually looks like. And so we put things in those different quadrants. And then we talk about like, where do you think the problems are? right now and everybody goes right to that like national multinational capitalism thing like when they actually look at what's there Mm -hmm. in the different quadrants they totally get it and so um and so i've been using my sort of like facilitator teacher brain a little bit to actually get out there and like get into some really interesting deep conversations with people and once they get that like so this is pretty much what i'm talking about is like worker ownership and a democratized economy and like not having the one percent control everything I have yet to have an audience not get it. 
And that's been actually terrific and surprising and very gratifying. And I feel like we're opening up space to be able to be having conversations about socialism and, you know, about like, you know, what's the nature of the society we want to be having? And so we're asking some questions that don't usually get asked in Wyoming politics. And that's been really fun. And I feel like people have basically been very gracious and, you know, and I'm not an asshole, so that helps, you know, (laughs) really friendly. I'm like, you know, people feel like they can talk to me about stuff. And, um, and so actually I, I have really, enjoyed i didn't enjoy slapping basically another full-time job on top of already being an economic struggle and like working way too much um but i have really enjoyed the actual campaign events and getting out there and actually talking to people and folks have been surprisingly receptive once they actually get what it is i'm really talking about and get past the labels that's one of the things that i think is so um gratifying about um advocating for what we do i'm an anarchist or i describe as one um so people online will tell me that I'm not because I believe in some kind of transitionary state, but the, the semantics, what, whatever the case is, you know, the long-term goal of, of a stateless, classless society, it's very good, mm-hmm. but we have a ways to go. And I think, and we agree on this, I imagine the first step is workplace democracy to, yeah. um, to, to alleviate income inequality, to yeah. disempower the bourgeois. And the nice thing about that is it's so intuitive that it's we don't we don't have to if you're if you're some if you're some austerity loving um you know uh, uh capitalist conservative you have to go on the you have to invent like ad teams to sell what you know what you're offering to the public you have to you have to restructure the entire ideological framework of society to convince people that it's in their best interest to allow businesses to pay them as little as humanly possible for the work they do you have to uh, you have to sell them this like it's 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 i imagine it's exhausting and all we have to do is say like hey wouldn't it be great if the place you worked at gave you some choices over mm-hmm. how you wanted that place to be run? Simplest question, yeah. only an idiot would say no or some sort of perpetually servile person. I don't know. Maybe like there's a Dobby Hell's Elf situation out there somewhere. But I think most people fundamentally right. get it's kind of weird. We live in a democracy, but eight hours mm-hmm. of every day is spent in an institution that controls our livelihoods over which we have literally no control. And we can yep. sell that to them. And that will resonate with anybody, mm-hmm. with with people who hate the gays or with people who want to live on some queer eco commune. It will. <laughs> I think everyone wants this. And that's our benefit. That's our sales pitch that nobody else can match. Right, right. Yeah. And I and and so I've been also explicitly using the example of um, coal companies in Wyoming and talking about worker ownership and talking about like, so how different do we think the energy sector would be in Wyoming at this point if we had if if worker ownership was the default instead of the very rare exception like all the so and I don't know how much you've been tracking what's been happening here, but there's um, several companies that have basically been being passed from one wealthy owner to another wealthy owner to another wealthy owner. They go bankrupt, um, file bankruptcy, wipe out all of their social debts, um, wipe out all of their previous commitment to their workers, sell it to the next um, member of the 1%. Um, you know, six months to two years later, we repeat, they go into bankruptcy. They And meanwhile, every time that bankruptcy happens, the owners are walking away with a couple million dollars. And like bonuses, just um, win, yeah. just windmill the entire like labor in into the ground. You know, it's right, it's right, it's incredible, right. and nobody cares to to stop it at a higher level because this is the system right. functioning as intended. Right, right. And so, what would have happened if those coal mines had actually been owned by the workers? What if it was a true worker-owned cooperative, a true socialist business? And you know, a they wouldn't have been caught off guard. They wouldn't have found out that they were losing their jobs because their paychecks bounced on Friday, which literally happened to a bunch of people here. Um, they wouldn't have been giving anybody two million dollars while their retirement plans and you know and retirement health insurance was wiped out, which has happened multiple times. I mean, there's just this whole series of things, and probably they would have diversified some of those companies a long time ago where there's been this fight about diversification within the energy um, you know sector in 
Wyoming. And it's like, I think that if it had been owned by people who were committed to those local communities, I mean, it's their families, it's their communities that are getting completely fucked in the process. And if they had actually been the ones calling the shots, I think we'd have a completely different energy sector right now because they would have seen the writing on the wall and gone like, oh, maybe we shouldn't just be coal mining at this point. Maybe we should be moving into some of these other things that are growing sectors instead of dying sectors. And, you know, and of course they don't get to do that. Like they don't have control. They don't have very much control over the safety of their workplaces. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that I think would just be really, really different. Um, and I think it's been good to like, like use coal as an example of that because that's the, the hot issue right now in Wyoming. Well, probably coronavirus is the hotter issue right at the moment, but. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, at the moment, yeah, you know, the whole, um, yeah. you, you've been taking care, I imagine. Yes. Mostly. And I, I have chronic Lyme disease, so I, I have, you know, probably some degree of immunosuppression already. So, yes, we've been. Okay, and my community be, be, be safe. You know, OK, I just I try my best. See, the great thing is, you know, my job um, doesn't self quarantining hasn't really affected, um, you yeah. know, me all that much, which has been nice. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I didn't I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, or actually, I wanted to add to what you were saying. This is actually something I'm curious for your opinion on as a as a, as a fellow socialist. Um, okay. I'm actually not a fan at all of Bernie's protectionist policies um, about uh, pre preventing like uh, automation, about preventing the outsourcing of jobs, um, because I've always believed that while it is necessary to maintain, you know, labor and, and work and decency for the people here who relied on those jobs, I think it would be better done by playing into our sort of uh, comparative advantage, the specialization of our industries, and mm -hmm. not like teaching them how to code or anything, but helping mm -hmm. us gracefully transition into a service economy that is socialized, mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. trying to hold on to this um, this factory economy or this, this industrial economy that seems mm -hmm. like is kind of inevitably wilting away anyway. Um, and, and I feel like it would hurt us to try and hold on to that. What, what's your opinion on that? Well, I, I mean, I think it's really complicated because there's like international justice issues in play and there's That's like, you know, us, you know, having enough jobs here in play and that kind of stuff. I mean, generally speaking, I think borders are stupid. And so, you know, if protectionism is about like protecting a group of people within a certain border, like generally that's not going to fly with me. And I also am interested in us doing things like looking at a 30 hour work week and, you know, raising wages to the point that like you can make it on 30 hours a week. And I think the key to that is getting the CEO salaries and, you know, I think the key to that is is socializing the economy and having it be much more of a worker owned thing. And and the appeal to me about that is that I think you would see local communities being able to figure out for themselves what do we want our community to look like and what does that mean in terms of businesses. And and I think that that would take some of the um, sort of some of the juice out of the sort of international trade um, arguments and. You know, and I'd be so I find myself really curious about like what what does it look like if we get further down the road in terms of you know automation, if we move toward having more economic justice and worker protection for our people here, like how would that organically shift some of these dynamics where we wouldn't have to be playing these protectionism games? Um, so that's kind of I go kind of a couple of levels up from the policy into like well what's the actual system that those policies are within and let's work at shifting those systems. Okay. Yeah. Um, I totally, okay. I completely agree with that. Yeah. It's really mm -hmm. important to approach this from like a, well, on one level, it's best to do this, but then actually the real problem is this, but actually, and you, you go because it's so, I mean, the economy, nobody understands the economy. A lot of people mm -hmm. pretend to, uh, you know, stock investors can't predict the best stocks 50% of the time. Nobody, nobody has any idea what's going on. So having mm -hmm. a, at least a foundational understanding of what trends are good or bad, um, mm -hmm. or, or what, is sort of the root of a problem, I think is really important. Because you're right. I mean, local sustainability, I think, should be the ultimate end goal. Even in a, I think even in a incredibly futuristic society, I mean, if we somehow, like post-scarcity, I still think there would be social and economic benefits to local sourcing for food or whatever 
products, e- even in some Star Trek, you know, uh, materializer type world, I still think there would be a benefit to that. So mm-hmm. that is something we should be pursuing, extigent of whatever broader topics are being discussed with protectionism right. and globalism and what have you. Right. Right. Well, and I definitely think that like the, you know, the, the tariffs that Trump just sort of, you know, he just kind of took an ax to a situation that if anything really did need to be done, and I'm not sure it did, you know, a scalpel would have been a lot more appropriate for, and, you know, and I'm, you know, I, I'm sitting here next to this, to um, a wood stove that we had installed in our community over the summer last summer, because our electric bills were horrific for heating the place that we're living in. And um, I had a conversation with the guy when he came out to put the stove in. And um, the the gist of the conversation was that I was talking about like whether we should put a wood stove in a different part of the property as well. And the price of stove pipe has gone up so much that that alone made it impossible for us to consider um, putting the second stove in, which would have been like financially beneficial in the long run. Right. And at one point he said, I swear to God, that man is trying to kill my business. And he was talking about Donald Trump. And um, and I have heard that echoed from lots of small business people where it's like, they're just getting completely fucked right now. And it's like, like I, I don't know exactly what all the answers are, but I'm pretty sure what Trump did is not it. <laughs> yeah, you know? you know, finding the perfect solution, very difficult, not fun. Finding a better solution, actually very easy this time. That's tough. Uh, as, as, a, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think tariffs are, there might be some incredibly narrow niche ways in which tariffs can be applied effectively. But but this just like, oh, no, China? No. Steel? No. Like, idiotic. Um, maybe? No. Yeah, so <laughs> be, yeah just um, yeah. absurd, you yeah. know? Uh, maybe if only we had tariffed uh, 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 Corona, uh, maybe we, uh, we you know, it wouldn't right? have been affordable for them to bring it in. Oh, God. <laughs> it's, um, I, I want to talk to you about that, by the way. Um, because it's on everyone's minds. It's, I mean, I think during our conversation, um, Trump just gave a national address, um, declaring a state of emergency during Mm -hmm. this convo. I guess I'll have to talk about that when we're done. Um, so there was a lot of, the beginning of Corona was really weird because at first it was, so some early cases happened late last year. And then we heard there was some like new flu in China and instantly there was this wave of media panic that was really disproportional because mm-hmm. like China's numbers had been released and it didn't look that bad. But then it seemed like they were understating those numbers a bit and then people started speculating it was because the Chinese eat bats like like or something like that, which to my knowledge has been not at all substantiated. Um, okay. or that it was from some bio lab and the numbers kind of got up there and it feels like we kind of blinked and it went from nothing to a global pandemic mm-hmm. and the stock market is in free fall right now, um, right. which I find personally find very funny. I know it's not um, uh, uh, at all funny. It's going to affect a lot of people's livelihoods, but the idea of Trump injecting one and a half trillion into right. our stock market and then two hours later it just goes back down to where it was is i i, I cannot help it a joker-esque you know i laugh or i will cry what do right. you think is there any grassroots work that you believe can be done um to help out your local community um mm-hmm. in in this time because it seems like a good federal response is just not coming right right yeah, and I wish that one point five trillion dollars had gone into public health initiatives, but you know, that's <laughs> one point five trillion. Can you imagine they could have set up right. quarantines across I... the country? Well, and it's also like like can we say Medicare for all? You know, yeah. like um so but I do I do think that, you know, we're we're seeing a lot of um local communities and a lot of states who are responding, I think, much more responsibly than the feds are and you know, and are you know, shutting down public schools, shutting down the universities, you know, our, um, so I'm in the town where the University of Wyoming is, and they, right now, they've just extended spring break by an extra week, which starts, you know, tonight. School out, and, baby. Yeah, extra the time off. Kids school. in my block are very happy. They're running around yeah. screaming because they've all been let out for five weeks. Right, right. 
Um, so, so I do think that there's been some good responses there. I also think that people, you know, who are in like social networks together, getting, you know, getting together or getting together online and like having conversations about like, what can we do? Um, in order to, you know, they're talking about flattening the curve is this phrase that's starting to go around right now because um, our our hospital infrastructure in this country and particularly in rural areas is nowhere close to prepared to deal with this. We're going to have people who are dying at home and who are, you know, suffering at home because there just are not enough hospital beds. And so one of the most important things is you know, it's probably inevitable that people we know are going to be affected by this. The estimates right now are that we're going to lose a million Americans before this thing is over. Um, so it will touch your life directly at some point. And fewer people will die if we can slow down the transmissions. So even if the same number of people get it over a longer period of time, that's going to mean that our hospitals are able to actually keep up a lot better with it. Um, and so whatever folks can be doing to slow it down, I think that's one part. The other thing is think about working class families and what the effects are going to be of this. And so, you know, we have people who are going to be forced to go to work because you don't get any paycheck if you don't go to work. Not shaming the hell out of those people, you know, is I think really important because it's like they don't have a choice. Like they are more likely, more certainly to suffer by losing their housing because they couldn't take a paycheck for two weeks, then they are going to die of coronavirus. And everybody's doing that calculation in their head right now among working class and the working poor. Um, so I think that's important. And also, you know, figuring out what can we do to make sure that we're having best practices and, you know, and washing your hands is right up there on the list, you know, um, so I think having conversations about it. Um, so I live in a small intentional community now. Um, we have six people that live on a piece of property together. And we just had a whole conversation yesterday about like, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we're going to be like cleaning all the doorknobs in the house once a day with like, and you know, with alcohol. And like, we're doing these really practical, almost silly seeming things. And we're also making a plan for, okay, um, if Yana's the one who gets sick, what is that going to look like? What's our plan? What does Yana need in order to go through a really bad sickness? You know, what if it's this person? Like, what does that person need? And what's our quarantine plan if the hospital doesn't have space and we have to keep people at home? And so I think we can be having those conversations with our families. Like if you get sick and there's not space at the hospital, what do you need in order to go through that? And and I think that that's smarter than just generalized hoarding, which is what we're seeing now, like getting really specific, like what does each person in your family need, um, you know, based on what they know about themselves when they're sick, what are they gonna need to get through it the best? And so I think having really relational um, conversations and planning, I think is something that we can all be doing at the smallest level. And the more of us that are doing that, um, the more we're gonna be able to slow this thing down. Yeah. The worst thing is, I'm pretty sure, you know, I haven't done the math. I'm pretty sure you can't just pause an economy as nice as that would be, you know, because right now, the worst thing, all these service workers, if you work service, you're virtually guaranteed at some point to get it. There's yeah. there's nothing, all the money you come in contact with, all the people, like it's, it's almost a foregone conclusion. It's just yeah. a matter of, you know, uh, trying to, I guess, resist it and you know, take as much, uh, eat as many oranges as you can. But yeah, yeah. We, if, you, system. if yeah. you follow that cycle back, some people can continue doing work, administrative, bureaucratic work. A lot of these people can work from home. Great, cool. The economy survives. Maybe a few people come in to make sure like the office isn't ransacked by, uh, you know, Mongolian hordes uh, 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 or something oh, of the sort. Don't blame the Mongols. Come on. <laughs> So, sorry, it's all that Han Chinese propaganda still getting to me, okay? Right, you know, exactly. e even exactly. all these decades later. But yeah. um, but we, we can't stop the service work because if we did, I mean, that shuts down like almost our entire economy. It feels like we don't have a way to deal with these w mm -hmm. with these pandemics without just eating a financial hit. That will inevitably mean, you know, uh, some, you know, people in Wall Street get one less yacht that year and right. the rest of us get uh, a decade of of austerity and economic, yeah. you know, turmoil. Right. Right. Well, and I think this I think this whole thing really, you know, from to pop up back to the policy level, I mean, I think it 
you know, it's making the case for Medicare for all and for paid sick leave and, you know, for raising the minimum wage so that people actually have a little bit of a cushion so that, that you know, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you can't just stop working and not get a paycheck and think that you're still going to be living, you know, a few months from now. I mean, it's, it's really... Um, you know, we're really seeing the nasty underside of neoliberal capitalism right now. And many, many more people are going to die because of that. And and it is breaking my heart that a lot of those people are, you know, working in poor people who just like they can't afford to not set themselves up for getting this thing. You know? I think rent needs to be frozen, uh, just just flat. Yeah. Um, if people can't make money because they can't go to work because they don't want to die, then yeah. landlords who make their money off of sitting on their asses should also not get to make their money. If we can pause rent, I mean, also, if we're talking about widespread economic damage, the damage done to the economy, f freezing rent for two or three months, mm -hmm. should, landlords, they'll, I'm sure they'll live. I'm sure they'll survive. But the damage done by millions of people being foreclosed on or, or having to be evicted because they couldn't make rent, because they can't work, because of coronavirus, that is infinitely greater damage to the economy. At this point, it's just a matter of, do we want mild inconvenience to the wealthy or cataclysmic, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 deprivation towards the poor. And right. I think, and America knows what choice it's going to make. I just don't like it. I disagree with the choice uh, that it right. is making. Well, and I think it'll be interesting to see if there is any pivot that happens in the Democratic primary between Sanders and Biden right now, because I think this has been a reality check for a lot of people where it's like, who have been buying into the like, oh, Medicare for all is just like really pie in the sky. And, you know, and it could be that like the the DNC propaganda machine is just going to like keep chugging along and like Biden is just going to, you know, end up with the nomination. But I wonder if it's actually going to shift the dynamic a little bit. And And I don't like the idea of benefiting from something like this. Um, but it's, but the timing is very the time, interesting. Uh, the timing. I, Hey, Hey, I mean, we're all going to die anyway. Timing's ripe. I'm telling you next, next debate on the 15th, Biden is going to start coughing when asked to answer a question. And at the next chance, uh, they're going to, they're going to cancel the next debate. And then for the final one, they're going to just put a cardboard, uh, cut out of him up there. Uh, everything's fine. You know, uh, no, no big. I actually, I actually am worried about them though. Bernie and Biden are both very, very old. They do a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, they meet a lot of people. Um, right. at, they're at the age point where even phenomenal health care might not actually be able to save them. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I know there's nothing to even say. It just sucks. And what does that mean? Do we get, we get Tulsi Gabbard? <laughs> yeah. I, you know what? All right, let's get our weird isolationist uh, uh, Gabbard presidency going. How do? You, out of total curiosity, how do you feel about her Gabbard? Before Trump, though, you know, I would. <laughs> how do you feel about about Gabbard? I I think she's all over the map. I mean, I think there's some things that you know I feel like she's spot on about, and you know, like the like I I appreciate having, a, you know, a vet who's actually a real vet, and I don't think Buttigieg counts. Um, who is like you know who is calling out the endless wars stuff like i really appreciate that i appreciate that she's an independent thinker in a lot of ways i'm not sure her thinking is always as sound as i would like but she isn't afraid to buck the dnc and i appreciate that about her a lot and and then there's like the weird you know the homophobic you know yeah she was really homophobic um which is which is funny because a lot of girls i know have a crush on her uh, so she's cute as hell yeah she's extremely but, cute but uh, she should be yeah. the one challenging trump to a push-up contest i feel she would she'd blow that out of the water forget biden um right. yeah. she is so confusing yeah she is very confusing and 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 i can say that I like more things about her than I do about Biden. So, you know, right, that goes yeah. down, including that she's a younger woman of color, which, you know, would be nice yeah. to get diversity in there. So, how, do you, how do you feel about Yang? Now that he's got a CNN job, I feel like he's uh, really rapidly approaching uh, corporate Democrat positions. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I wish that UBI had been sold by somebody else because I think that the particular way that Yang rolled it out 
which and I and it's confusing to me. Like I'm not actually sure where exactly he ended up on some of this stuff, but it seemed like the initial presentation of it was like, um, like, well, this is going to replace a certain amount of social services. And I'm like, that is so completely the wrong answer. Like, like I think that UBI makes a ton of sense in the context of a whole bunch of other reforms. Like, like I'm worried that if we did UBI right now without having some kind of like universal rent control along with it it's like all it would do is it would make landlords richer you know i mean that's really where that money would end up and so i think he had like a good idea that could have in a different context been really potent and he didn't do enough of the work around like actually connecting with the people who have been working on ubi in much more um like economic and racial justice informed ways like the new economy coalition like that's a kick-ass batch of organizations that we've been having the conversation about UBI in that context for a while. And I wish Yang had actually been like working with some of those folks because I think he could have gotten a lot further with yeah, a lot exactly. more. Exactly. It, it feels like all the solutions he proposed are on the cusp of being, yep. you know, adjacent to progressive <laughs> socialist policies. Yep. But he, yep. he, he got them all from like a tech bro perspective. The funny thing is the, the yep. thing that, Yang said that I agree with more than anything else, like like far and away. What only came just a few days ago after he dropped out, which is after Trump put the 1.5 trillion into the economy, uh, Yang said that could have given every single American like $5,000. Um, and yeah. I think just this once, I think that actually would have been pretty goddamn great because the... That's not enough yeah. time, just that 5,000, that's not enough time for all the landlords to just instantly, they're usually rules, you have to wait a certain time before jumping right. up your, your your rent, which means that would have just been 5,000 to allow you to not go to work and pay for groceries uh, um, right. for, for right. like six months for a lot of right. people. Well, and I think, didn't Gabbard just make a proposal in the house to do like a $2,000 per person one time we UBI? should. We can clearly afford it. Trump literally just put more. How much money? Chat, you're, you've are multiple tabs open. Chat, how much money did Trump just put into the economy a second time? Didn't he do it again? He just did it while we were talking. Uh, they'll answer me in a second. But we have the money. Federal, they can just print right. off more money. V v v just print off another. <laughs> right. B bajillion. Right. Um, oh, it's 500 billion? 500 billion. That's, that's more than a thousand for every American. Okay, I'm getting yeah. different answers from everyone. I don't know. F forget that. Shit ton. A shit ton of money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. It could have been. I mean, you know, in the hands of somebody who actually thinks through these things, it could have been amazing, that amount of money getting dropped in America somewhere or somewhere. But, that, yeah, this was not the right answer. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you – this is what I've said – and I guess I'd like to um, uh, wrap it up a little bit um, to uh, uh, keep it, uh, you know, an appreciable length for the viewers. And also because I apparently have to go watch some national emergency address, um, <laughs> which will be fun. But this is what I always say to people when they when they ask me, like, why or what I'm aiming for, you know, like to get Bernie Sanders to be the president. I mean, that's cool. Sure. But not really. No. Mm -hmm. What I've always said is I believe that a revolution is inevitable um that some point down the line it's not necessarily going to be ours but at some point down the line our economy will fail our systems will collapse this will probably come in ad adjacent to climate change and mm -hmm. there will be some extra legal force that will try to seize control of a broken country and what mm -hmm. i want when that happens i think it's probably going to be climate refugees you know when hundreds of millions of people get displaced because their cities are underwater and we're going to have these people you know trying to come in here and god look at how europe handled a few million um migrants imagine how hundreds of millions spread across the globe would act um or, or be responded to and when that time comes i think we will either have a fascist revolution where we will build an ethno state where we will build walls where we will court on people off into camps or we will have a socialist revolution where we will recognize that it is the existence of those borders and of those divisions which created these problems and my goal is when that mm -hmm. revolution happens, there are more people who are socialist in this country than there are who are fascist adjacent. That's what mm -hmm. I aim for, that spread of class mm -hmm. consciousness. Do you think, I mean, because you're doing just that. What you do 
and the people who you inspire, which I, I, you know, I haven't met every single one of them. I imagine, you know, you do your work and the people who will come after um, what you do. This is the, 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 the groundwork of that process. Um, which is why it's so cool, I guess, that I get the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, so thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on that generally? Is that optimistic? Is that pessimistic? I don't even know. That's just how I, how I feel. I, I, I share your vision and I share somewhere really deep inside me, the desire for that to be the outcome with this. And, you know, I realized, I don't know, five or six years ago that I don't actually know what I'm doing with the rest of my life. Like I'm either, um, I'm either helping turn the ship in a positive way, or I'm bearing witness to the end of my species, or I'm creating some comfort for people as we're on the way out. Um, and I don't know, I still don't know what I'm doing as far as those three things. But to some extent, it doesn't matter because I think the actions are all the same. Like, I think that we're, we need to be doing the same things. We need to be building, you know, a multiracial, multi-class, multi-gender, uh, you know, movement that is grounded in discernment and grounded in compassion. And we need to be building that at all levels from, from the, you know, like my individual consciousness to my family, to my community, all the way up to the national and international levels. And anything that any of us are doing that is heading off fascism and moving toward compassionate social and economic systems is a contribution to that. And um, yeah, and so I, I guess, and this really wasn't what you asked me, but I guess my exhortation to everybody listening is just like, find your niche and like lean into it hard right now, because this is, this is the moment where I think we're, we're laying the foundation that's going to take us in one or the other direction. And, you know, we can't, I don't think we can give up. I think you can take time off to mourn and to be angry and that's great. But I think we need to put our shoulders to the grindstone and like, just keep at it and doing whatever it is that you can do from whatever platforms you have in your life. I mean, that's the, that's the core thing at this point is just keep pushing it in that direction and Hopefully we'll push it far enough before that break point comes. I agree. And I think, and I think frankly, uh, that pessimism is lazy um, and, and counter-revolutionary. When, when people look at the breadth, I've, I mean, I've said this, um, there's so, the, the difficulties uh, that have been faced by sort of our, our, our press, you know, our, our ancestors, if you want to say that, our socialist, you know, comrades in the past, quite a bit, in many respects, harder than ours. I mean, they would be bombed by their own government, you know? We're not getting shot when we go out to protest, or at least, you know, not that often. Um, well, unless you're indigenous. And then, uh, uh, true. That is true. I, for, for them, they can be pessimistic all they want. For the most part, we, we are, stand atop a mountain of achievements from people who have suffered quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And they didn't give in to despair. Uh, they did not, you know, relinquish themselves to pessimism. And I think it's irresponsible of us to do the same because pessimism is lazy and it doesn't really, uh, you know, get any work done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel fortunate enough that like, I, like, I think that there's a, there's a trauma informed piece to this where, you know, I was very lucky to not have the kind of young life that set me up for a tremendous amount of trauma later in life. And I think I think those of us who are in the kind of position that I'm in where you know we don't have we don't have that level of trauma that we're dealing with I think we in particular should feel obligated to be um, at the front lines of this and not you know letting people who actually you know who it's a lot harder to do this kind of work uh, lead it like I think we need to be leading it as much as possible um, yeah so I'm with you Yana mm -hmm. I um Actually, wait, I, I don't think I ever clarified. Is it Ludwig or Ludwig? Uh, it's Ludwig, actually. It's like the most Americanized version of a very gotcha. German. Okay, that I've been mispronouncing it this whole time. My sincerest apologies. I will ameliorate that mistake. Now, Jana okay. Ludwig, thank you so goddamn much for taking the time to speak with us. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I know I don't know if you can see my chat or if you've, if you've got it open, but they have been um, very positively disposed towards okay. you the entire time. Great. 
Well, pop, pop me a link to it so I can go. Um, I can go look at it because I've just been on our um, our Discord thing here. I haven't actually been looking at it. Uh, so. ab- absolutely, yeah. Here, um, wait, that's the wrong one. <laughs> wait, don't click. Wait, don't don't don't, don't, click don't worry. Button. Don't worry about that one. That's my. That's the top secret admin. Well, what, whatever the case is, yeah. Um, they are here. Wait, chat. Save your save your love. Uh, just a second so that it's only visible when uh. Uh, do do Still not very good at navigating my own chat. There you go. There oh. we go. Now, now all of you d- d- deploy the d- d- affection. Um, cool. Yeah, everyone say thanks, Yana. Comrade Yana, love it. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Ah, they have just... cute frogs. Trans rights. trans rights. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will, um, I'll, I'll use the links that you provided me in, in the, the, the description, of course, donate, please. Everyone, uh, if you have, uh, the time and inclination, please do donate to, um, Yana's campaign and more broadly to the Rose Caucus. Um, this work that is being done here is valuable and it is, mind you, impossible for us mm-hmm. to move forward in this country through electoral means without, uh, working through, uh, uh, uh non- uh, you know, presidential politics. So please take well that lesson. And um, uh, 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 yeah, overall, I think we can roundly say uh, uh, Trump is bad. I hope he gets replaced. Yes, most definitely. All right. Thank you, everybody. Y'all look awesome. I'm just like watching this scroll past and y'all look amazing. <laughs> Have a wonderful yeah. day. Thank you. You too. Stay <laughs> safe. Thanks. You too.